Good evening, Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order. It's December 20th. Welcome. It is 6.04. Sorry for the delay, everyone. And we have Ann Golub, who is here with us via Zoom. Thank you for being here. We have Shelly, Katie, and myself, Angela. And with that, are there any additions and amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, we'll go right to the approval of the December 6th regular meeting. Is there a motion? You what? Uh, I make a motion to accept the minutes as written. Yeah. I second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great. December 7th, special town meeting. We don't have to vote on those? We don't. Okay. That is great. Thank you for writing those up. And then December 13th, budget meeting. Is there a motion to accept? I'll make a motion to accept. Second? I'll second it. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 I abstain. I wasn't there. Just getting to that. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> <laughs> and good evening, Jay. You're on for the road foreman and commissioner's report. Okay. Uh, the Arch Bridge detour signs have been installed. Um, and I have a meeting Wednesday with the B-Trans biologist to find locations for the bat houses near the bridge. Um, one item and I have a phone meeting with Bob Fisher tomorrow about the beaver problem on with Walt Hill. And the radar sign on Route 30 north of the village has been installed and it's working. And it. since Friday morning, there's been 6,666 cars have gone through. Holy mackerel. <laughs> um, and the cleaning and the greasing of Monroe Bridge, um, we got that grant and we've been working on the budget for that. I'm wondering if we should put that out to bid now so the contractors don't get booked up for spring. Um, I don't know what your thoughts were. Um, what was that again? It's the, the greasing of the Monroe Bridge. The, the steel work on the bridge, it's mm -hmm. the, the rest of the rehab of that bridge is the steel work where they go in and uh, they grind all the rust off, prime it, and then grease it. Did we already approve that? We were working on budgeting for it, but no, we haven't, because um, we got the grant for it last year. Oh, okay. And so we're hoping to do it this summer, but um, I guess they tend to get booked up pretty quickly. Um, so I wondered if we should put it out to bid now in hopes of getting somebody to do it this summer. I, I said go motion? ahead if you think. Yeah, I'll make a motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion to have Jay go ahead and put the bid out for the Moreau Bridge repairs with the intent of what, getting funding for it? No. We have the, the grant from the state and then we're budgeting in capital for the rest of it. Okay. Um, and then if, even if we put it out to bid, if for some reason the budget changes down the way. We don't have to go forward with it, but at least we have somebody online to do it if we if we want to go ahead. Okay, well that's good. So find a contractor really to Yeah. Is there a second to Shelley's motion? I'll second that. I second. Thank you, Ann. But Katie, beat you to the punch. Is there any further oh, discussion? Katie, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ann. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great. Okay. No fourth on that, Jay. And that's it. Thank you. So I just have a, a question for Jay. I know we talked about um, the signs that you put up and with the black plastic. So I just wondered if you could just give a little statement about what those, why there's signs with black plastic on it. So those won't get uncovered until the detour is actually open. Um, so what they do is they tell people the bridge is closed and where the detour is and directs them around the detour. So we'll cover those in March right before the, the work starts or the day of the work starting. And then, uh, then people will 
we'll have to follow the detour after that. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to accept the road foreman and commissioner's report? I make a motion to accept. Is there a second? A second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great. One out of the administrative assistance report. And thank you, Jay, for all your hard work. We really appreciate everything you and the guys do. I want to extend our appreciation and thank Walter Hagendorf and WW Building Supply for donating and replacement of the picnic table here at the town office. Oh, nice. Nice. The VLCT Ag Advocacy News is an overview of the legislative preview and the schedule for the new legislative session starting January 4th. We will not know until early to mid-January if we can hold an in-person town meeting. So that's still <coughs> pending in legislation. Great. I have received a timeline for this year's town report. I will be working very hard to get the first draft to the printers on time. Would you please send your reports as soon as possible, but no later than January 10th in order to meet this deadline? And then with the select board commission, I would like to use a vacation day on Thursday and Friday off for Christmas holiday. Uh, how many reports are you, actually, can we have a, is that the interview report? It is. Is there a motion to accept the report? I'll make a motion to accept. We didn't have any written reports for either one. Right? No, we didn't. So. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, let's have discussion. How many reports are you missing? Um, and we're working on the select. I think there's six that are still out, plus the town clerk and the treasurer. I can't actually expect theirs until December 31st when end of their session closes. Okay. So there's at least six or seven, not including those. And have you reached out to everyone to? I, I have. Okay, great. I think and right now I have three that I've already received. Jane is one, the Listers is another, and I think those are the two that I've received. Great. Listers, and when you say Jane, DV Fiber. Oh, yeah, DV Fiber. fiber. And who are the other ones that are out there? Uh, the DRB, the Planning Commission. Uh, the zoning administrator. I'll make we start and I'm putting on speaker. Select time. board. Yep. There's five or six that I'm still waiting for. Just to interrupt, uh, Mike Fitzpatrick, another select board member, has joined via phone, just so everyone's aware. <clears throat> Great. If you could send out another reminder. Yep. That would be wonderful. And let them know that it needs to be in by which date. This year, while town meeting is in session, will Zoom also be available? No. 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 Okay. Only because of the complicated nature. If, if we're doing um, a hybrid, we have to have ability to communicate with those that are attending via Zoom. Oh. We don't have that set up other than here. Okay. So, um, we could end up doing Australia ballot like we did last year and have the informational meeting the night before if legislature so passes. Otherwise, it could be um, a regular in person with whatever mandates or requirements the select board puts on. And we'll find out the legislature in mid January. Um, mid January, we should hear from, from, from them. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Wendell. Yep. And as to your vacation days for the Christmas holiday, um, my feeling is if, if you get the minutes done and the agenda for Monday night's meeting, I don't see any, and you have the time, I don't see any problem with it. Let's say other board members. Say it's great. Day. It's Christmas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you worked really hard, so we really do appreciate everything you do for us. Thank you. All right, any further discussion on the administrative assistance report? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 
Aye. And we have to do roll call because we have phone. Mike? Aye. Anne? Aye. Shelly? Aye. Katie? Aye. Angela? Aye. Thank you. Hi, Jane Douglas. Good evening tonight. You are on the hot seat for your special report. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, I was going to come in in person, but you know, the wood stove is going. It's nice and warm here. I can't blame you. <laughs> Enjoy it. I'm being really lazy. Well, um, I don't know how many people know, but I am the newfane representative to the DB Fiber Governing Board. Um, and according to my job description as a member of the governing board, I'm supposed to report to the select board on occasion. And, uh, I think I've done it in a really long time, so I do apologize about that. There hasn't been a lot happening. Um, for people who don't know, New, the town of Newfane is part of the DVCUD, which is a communications union district um, that was set up by the state of Vermont a couple years ago to uh, bring broadband, high-speed broadband to all the unserved and underserved ta uh, towns in the state of Vermont. And uh, we've been working hard. We, we actually have been transitioning from being a, gee, maybe we can do it, to a, can we do it? Can we find the money to, oh my god, we've got the money, and we, now we have to do it. So um, it's been a, a definite a rethink, a lot of realigning of people's positions in the group, but we are, are meeting regularly and uh, things are moving along. Um, the first the phase one project is for the six towns, which I wrote down because I can never remember them, Halifax, Marlboro, Reedsboro, Stamford, Worthboro, and Whitingham because they are the least served of all the 24 towns in the district. So they will be being done first. And we got a, uh, I think it was $4.1 million grant to do the finish up the pre-construction plans and uh, begin uh, all the coordination with GWI, who is going to actually do the work. So that is that money has come, and we've spent it. We've been approved for $23 million already for next year to get started with construction, and hopefully construction will be starting as soon as the ground thaws. So, wow, uh, that's, that's wonderful. wonderful. Yeah, we're, we're pretty excited actually, actually be getting something done. You know, it, this has been a lot of work on part of a lot of people. Um, you know, so it's good to see it going. Um, Mostly, I just wanted to make sure that you all knew we're still out there. We're still going ahead. Um, you know, unfortunately for the town of Newfane, we're about 72% covered by high-speed internet already. So that puts us pretty far down the list. But we, if we're really lucky, and if the cable, optical cable, is available, because right now there's a big shortage of optical cable. But if we can get all that cable, we will be hitting Newfane hopefully in, in 2023. So no promises. Can't make any promises, but we're hoping. So. We really appreciate you and all of your hard work that you put into this and reporting back to us. Thank you so much. Well, you know, if anybody has any questions or, or you know, is interested in anything, please get in touch with me. Um, you know, I, I'm 802-348-7454. Um, any questions from any of you since I'm representing you? Katie? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, when New Fame gets its turn, uh, the people without service will get service first? Is that how that works? Or the people who have only one option will be given a second option so they have a choice? How does that work? Um, the, mandate, the mandate from the state is that the unserved are first. Mm -hmm. So. Those people in town, like I said, we've only got 28% of the town of Bufay that's not already covered. So they will get first. By a slightly fluky way the rollout is going to happen, though, it, because when you're running down the road with, with optical fiber, you don't just stop because you came to the town line. 
you know, you keep going until you run out of people who aren't covered yet. So some parts of our town actually may have the option of joining maybe next summer. But it will completely depend on how the rollout goes, how it goes down the road. Once all the roads that have no fiber on them now are wired up, then they will start running other places. And other people may have the option, we haven't really discussed it a lot because it's not a priority, but there will be the option for people who are along that line to also tap in and switch if they want to. So it's, it's nobody's really quite said how we're gonna do that because I don't think we wanna promise people something that may or may not happen right away. I, I'm just, yeah. I have a question. Shelly? I'm not really, um, really sure about, but we're receiving um, internet through a cabling system versus an optic cable or optic Is fiber. Is it different than consolidated communications availability in our area? Yeah, con consolidated, I believe, is still, in our area, is still copper wire. Um, Comcast, which is what most of us are on because the Comcast... Uh, oh, I don't have that option. option. <laughs> um, you know, Comcast is on optical fiber on some of the parts of town. Okay. Um, last time I looked at the maps, um, parts of us are still on a slower form of cabling, but I believe Route 30 now actually is don't don't hold me to that. Yeah, I just definitely. glanced at a map one time that showed where there was wasn't. I, I think you're right on that. I think Route 30, the main line, is on the fiber. Off. On the fiber. I'd be curious because yeah. like we've never had. We still don't have cable TV. You can't get it. They never bothered with our road, and I'm sure there's other roads in town like that. So, can we be on that list? <laughs> you you are you are on the list yeah, to understand. to get it first cool. whenever. <laughs> Yeah, um, the, the final plans are still being uh, reviewed and, and <clears throat> you know, we'll, it will depend on adjoining towns and where hubs go in, things like that, but we're hoping, yeah, you will be, definitely the people who have nothing right now will be top of the list. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Jane. you for the clarification. And we look forward to further reports when you find out more information. And yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully this will happen finally after being promised this for 10 years now by every governor we've had. Um, it's good to know that we're actually maybe going to make it, make it so. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. We really appreciate you and all that you do. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. And now we're going to move to our scheduled members of the public. We have a lot of appropriations this evening, so I believe our our standard is that we have three minutes to present and two minutes of Q&A. Is that correct, folks? Does that sound good for everyone? Sounds good. And our lovely administrative assistant will do our timer for us. So if I interrupt, I apologize in advance. Um, the first we have Christine Howe from The Mover. Welcome. It's good to have you tonight. Thank you. Hope everybody's doing well. Yes. Um, Sorry that you're all wearing masks again. It seems like it's the world we live in. We're never going to get rid of them. Uh, so just um, just introduce myself really quickly. I think I was here last year as well, but I think there's new faces on the board. Um, if you're not familiar with the mover, we are a 501c3 nonprofit transit provider. We provide services for this particular funding. We provide services for social services for elderly and disabled. Um, so we mostly medical trips, dialysis, um, cancer treatments is kind of what that falls under this year. We were able to fund social trips. It's limited, but at least we're allowing to have like somebody just book one today to go get their haircut. Um, so things like that. And so every year we send a request to all the different towns and town of New Fiend, we've requested $750. Um, I will say that when I was doing the letters, it was very interesting to compare the previous year, which was a little less COVID versus a COVID year, obviously. Um, ridership was incredibly low. Um, last year, we only did about um, 19 rides for the town of Newfane. 
the year before that we did 194. Yeah. And I did want to just I did want to let everybody know that this year already to date we're at 139 trips. So we are picking back up. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know that we have one particular client who uses us quite a bit from the town of Newfane. So that's my pitch. We're hoping for $750 again this year. Um, and um, that's what I've got. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much. Um, you, provide, you provide individual vehicle drivers that would... No, it's a, yeah, it's a combination. We have a, um, a whole slew of regular drivers that drive small buses. And then we also have volunteer drivers that drive individual cars. And it depends on, you know, the scheduling and how it works. We try to use volunteers as much as we can because those are the least um, least costly options. So it spreads the grant further and we get to do more trips. But we're struggling obviously with COVID with keeping volunteers. We've had a lot of volunteers come and go because of just concerns in general. So we have um, probably about 20 small vans slash buses on the road every day. Uh -huh. So we have both. Great. And just a side note, it's not part of this um, funding request, but I don't. I'm hoping you're all aware that we are doing a Route 30 study as well for okay, public great. transit. Okay. Yeah. We're still working on that. We're still, yeah, we're still working on that study, and and we're slowly getting. We just had a deadline hit last Friday, so we're slowly getting there on that study. So, but I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, thank you. Just a follow-up question about that. Um, I, would you would you expand on that just a little bit? Um, because I am curious about it. I came to the meeting at the Newburg Firehouse along with some other local folks, um, and that would be great to hear a little bit more about that. So we just finished up. Um, we we took a considerable amount of time to get the employers uh, to really get the employers to reach out that we wanted. So we we originally were going to be have a deadline at the beginning of December. We extended it a couple more weeks because we got the BDCC's help to get more input from employers along oh, the route. Um, so the next step, which I think is middle of January, is we're meeting with the consultants to start developing, so to speak, a rough draft of what the route looks like in times. And that will come back out to the public again for more input before we either finalize and then go for grant application. So we'll probably be back out to the public late January, early February. Great. Wonderful. Nice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for Christine? No, I'm good. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate you being here this evening. You're welcome. All right, next we have Maya Richmond from the Wyndham County Humane Society. Good evening. Glad to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm new to Wyndham County Humane Society after Annie's retirement this month. so. I'm just uh, my first meeting. Nice to meet all of you. So really quickly, the Wyndham County Humane Society is a nonprofit organization serving all the residents in the town of Wyndham County here in Vermont. And the mission is to ensure the safety and well-being of the animals, as well as enhancing the relationship between animals and people that love them through adoption, education, advocacy, and the promotion of animal welfare. So that is our mission statement. I'm sure you're getting familiar with our organizations. I see back in front of you, and I appreciate all your support over the years. Just to kind of give some idea here, if we have the contacted services for taking up unwanted animals and strays, the organization, since the start of COVID, has seen a huge increase in um, service demand for veterinary care. So we've always done some spay neuter, but recently, since the COVID hit, we've actually been able to grow the ability to provide basic services like vaccines and um, end of life care for pets and um, for their owners. Pre-COVID, it was about 60 people or pets that actually access the services. Year to date, we're at 101 residents from New Fame that have come through our doors just for veterinary services. Wow. And on top of that, we've also provided free food through our pet food pantry program. And about 10,000 pounds have come out into the, this community to provide for people to help offset the cost of okay. veterinary pet awesome. care as well. So our goal is to keep pets in the home as much as possible, not have them be surrendered due to financial reasons yeah. and care reasons. So right now, we're just asking for appropriation support to continue providing those resources to the residents of New Bay. What amount are you requesting? Yeah. Two thousand six hundred seventy-five in continued support. Yeah, thank you. So, um, 
Again, of the 101 residents. That's not them? No. no. I don't, actually don't have it yet. No, it's give not. It. Oh, sorry. Never mind. Scratch that. Um, will you it, let more What was it last year? Probably get level funding or something? Yeah, I will look it up. If you can email one and let her know the amount, that would be great. Yeah, I was looking at my report too. I'm like, hey, did they get that for me? <laughs> okay. Uh, and you're the new executive director? I am. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Annie left her about a couple weeks ago. Good. She's enjoying okay. her time. I know I shouldn't take the three minutes for that. She's <laughs> definitely enjoying her time in Joshua Tree. Um, but texting me, so I will get back to her in question. It sounds like you're expanding services down there. Yeah, they've always had a little bit of a clinic and done a lot of spay neuter resources, but again, veterinary care has been growing substantially. And you're going to build a new building down there, aren't you? The capital campaign got put on hold due to COVID, but we are revisiting those plans. Actually, we just finished a meeting today about that. So yeah, definitely need to address the facility and the facility needs. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, very well. Continue that. So, um, are there any other questions for Maya? Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here and for your report. And we look forward to an email with the amount you're requesting, and that's Thank wonderful. You. Congratulations on your position. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Becca or jo Johan Blancher from Valley Harris. Good evening. Glad to have you Hi. here tonight. Hi, welcome. And thanks for having us. This is Joanne. Um, and Becca's here with me for backup. I've been in Valley Cares for a little over a year, so I want to make sure she's here in case I can't answer something. Um, but as you probably all know, we're located in Townsend and we're a nonprofit uh, organization that helps uh, with senior housing. So we have the independent living and we have the assisted living and we also have what's called a SASH program, so support and services at home. Um, we currently have nine new fame residents on our SASH panel. Um, and then at the assisted and the independent living, we have 15 residents from new fame um, in those uh, units. And about 75% of our current residents at the independent and the assisted living are on some sort of uh, assistance like uh, Medicaid. So we, like many other people during COVID, have been struggling and doing the best we can to keep people safe. We are COVID free and excited about that. <laughs> um, but we are definitely looking uh, for support again this year um, and looking for um, a support of about $2,675 for the folks that um, are from New Fame that we assist. That's great. Thank you so much. Any questions? Um, what is the SASH program? It's the Support and Services at Home. Yeah, so that is a SASH coordinator who is much like a case manager and a SASH uh, wellness nurse that works with her. And they get a referral from anybody, from a doctor's office, from your local case management agency, who has somebody who either lives in the independent living or lives in the community who is struggling and needs a little bit of assistance with support in order to stay home. Uh, they don't take over for like uh, counseling, aging, or VNA, so to say, but they're there to help support. And there are some health initiatives that they work with specifically around diabetes and hypertension, but basically to help support them to remain living independent at home. That's fantastic. Any other questions for Joanne? Well, thank, thank you so much for all of your hard work and everything you all do for our community. We really appreciate it. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Angela, I have a question yes. for for her. Um, my mic didn't come on. That's uh, this is Gloria Cristelli, and I work with the West River Valley Mutual Aid. And as we give out the Everyone Eats meals, we seem to be finding out that maybe more and more people of the independent living could benefit from getting those meals. And I know that um, Mike Bills from Townsend is looking into that, but is there any way that we should do that more? I know that one person does receive meals every week through that. Mm -hmm. Is there something, uh, a better coordination? Should I have Mike contact you or? Yeah, we um, we don't do the Meals on Wheels anymore. It goes to the damn diner, but certainly you could contact us because this is a different yeah. program for meals. Right? Yeah, 
I would say contacting Jesse Cudworth, our SASH coordinator. She would be an excellent person to help coordinate that everyone eat. Yeah, I work with yes. Jesse on, on other issues. So. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Might as well take advantage of it because we are now going to be funded. Everyone eats through March. Because we found that out, so the FEMA um, money is going to back that. So that's the first we've heard of it uh, just this last week. That's one okay, thanks. Another great program. Any other questions for Becca or Joanne? All right, thank you again for being here and for your presentation. Thank you. Now we will hear from Linda Melody for the Vermont Center for Independent Living. Good evening, welcome. Uh, good evening, sorry, my dog is just now deciding that he's gonna get rowdy, so I apologize <laughs> uh, if he does. Um, I'm Linda Melody, I'm the Development Director for the Vermont Center for Independent Living. Um, thanks for this opportunity to present to you tonight. Uh, we are a disability rights and advocacy group of nonprofit. We are located in Montpelier, but we have five satellite offices, so we serve statewide. This year, we served three residents of New Fane. Uh, one received a ramp through our home access program, and one received we call it assistive technology, which is kind of a broad term. It could be a scooter, it could be hearing aids, it could be vehicle modifications. Um, so they um, received <clears throat> hearing aids through our Sue Williams Freedom Fund. We also have a Meals on Wheels program for people under the age of 60 with disabilities. After that, the Council on Aging takes over from us. We have, um, of course, our information referral and our peer advocacy counseling program, um, which basically all of our peer advocate counselors have disabilities themselves. So they have gone through a lot of the systems and red tape, if you will, so they can really kind of help navigate those difficult systems for people experiencing it. And we are requesting $220 from the town of New Fane, the same thing we've been asking for for a long time, because uh, um, most towns require petitions and we just don't have that kind of manpower, but we appreciate um, the town's continued support of us. Great, thank you so much. Are there any questions? Um, can you define more what, uh, what type of disabilities um, in people that you serve um, it's not an age-based, I, I would assume. There's no age limit in terms of disabilities, and we are we were the first cross-disability organization, which means um, any disability, um, physical disabilities, um, mental, deaf, hard of hearing, visual, all disabilities. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thank Thank you so much, Linda, for being here, and thank you for your presentation and for all your hard work. Thank you for the opportunity. Now we have, I'm sorry if I say it wrong, is it Bobby Rapuzzo from the Moore Free Library? Uh, Welcome. Good what? evening. Glad to have you. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Bobby Ragazeos. I am the president of the Moore Free Library, and uh, First of all, I want to thank you for your ongoing support of the library. Um, we are one year short of meeting our town's needs. One year short of 125 years wow. since Wilhelmina Moore um, gave to our town the Moore Free Library. And um, you know, we used to have just books, but now we have other media, including ebooks, audiobooks, CDs, DVDs. We now loan out some musical instruments and some sports equipment. We provide indoor and outdoor connections to our fiber optic network. We are a community meeting place. We have programs geared to a large variety of ages and interests. 
We also offer free interlibrary loan to all of the residents in your fame. And we are doing all we can possibly do to promote childhood literacy and to help parents with that. Um, I also want to add, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I believe we are the only public bathroom in New Fame. <laughs> it's very important. It's, it's very important. Uh, you'd be surprised to see how many people just pop in um, because they've been told at the store or somewhere else that there is a bathroom in the library. Uh -huh. um, we are currently um, needing to upgrade our electrical system in order to accommodate um, our first heat pump. Uh, it's our first step towards moving away from being dependent on, on fossil fuel. So uh, we're very pleased about that step. Um, last, or I'm going to say uh, during the 2020 year, we served 2,809 New Fame residents. But at the end of November 2021, thus far, we have served 3,185,000 residents. And the year is not up yet. So um, we are once again asking you for a donate to help our library. I'd like to just say that my granddaughter last year, uh, we rented snowshoes. And wonderful. this year she has asked for a pair for Christmas. So it's, it's wonderful that you have so many different things you can rent <laughs> or loan out. Well, I hope you didn't rent them because no, we, you just no, gave them. No, we signed them out. I used the wrong terminology, sorry. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, well, it's so one fun. of her favorite activities is snowshoeing because of that, so. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. Wonderful. Are there any questions for Bobby? Well, thank you for all of your hard work and everything the library is doing for our community. And we really appreciate your presentation and for you being here this evening. Thank you. And I want to wish you all a very good, happy, and safe holiday. You as well. Thank you. Thank you. you. And now we have Vicki from the Sterling from the Women's Freedom Center. Yes. Hi, Hi good Vicky, evening. How are you? So I am the director of the Women's Freedom Center, which is the domestic and sexual violence organization in Wyndham County. And our goal is to end physical, sexual, and emotional violence against women and their children by offering support and advocacy to all survivors of violence, as well as prevention and education activities to help create a community in which violence isn't tolerated. And some of the things we offer are a confidential hotline. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can skip a beat even with COVID. Um, in fact, we expanded access to our hotline and access for survivors through web chats. Um, we also offer shelter and safety planning. We do a lot of advocacy, outreach, community education, and we offer support groups, which are virtual have been since about April of last year. Um, we serve 10 residents of New Fane and their seven children at least known to us, I will say, 10 residents and seven children because of the nature of our work. Oftentimes survivors, when they call or meet with us, don't want to actually talk about where they're from. So we can only report on the ones that felt comfortable and safe enough to tell us. And this year we're asking for level funding of $1,000 to help support our work. And all of our services are obviously free and confidential. Thank you so much, Vicki. Any questions yeah. for Vicki? Uh, are there offices, it says at locations in Wyndham County, or is there one closer than Brattleboro to this area? There isn't, but we will meet with anyone wherever it's safe to do so. We also, I should say, we also provide emergency financial assistance, which also looks like transportation assistance if people don't have a way to get to us. Okay. 
And even if they do have transportation, if gas is a barrier to getting to us, we provide gas cards, we provide food cards, we provide state phones, um, whatever it takes to really make sure that someone can connect with us and, um, you know, that we can, we can provide whatever support is necessary. And I should say, it's, it's really survivor-led. So we talk with people who, I think sometimes people think that people have to be ready to leave an abusive relationship before they contact us, and that's not the case. We talk to survivors who want to stay in their relationships and just want to talk about how they can be safer. We talk to survivors who are in the process of leaving. We talk to survivors who have left and need support after that fact. Um, we also now are working on the issue of human trafficking. So that's, that is something that we're expanding into as it's become an ever-increasing issue. Um, not only in our area, but the state and the country. So, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions for Vicki? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and it's important work, and we really appreciate you being here tonight to present to us. Bobby, Bobby has a question. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Bobby, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Am I still on sound? Okay. I. I just um, can't help but be moved in hearing what Vicki talked about, especially since I'm a retired um, psychologist and everything I read about the increased numbers of domestic violence uh, sin that has occurred since the and the increased number of child abuse cases since the lockdown for COVID since our restricted movements have begun. And Vicki, thank you. You're doing a wonderful thing. And I only hope that you can increase your presence along this process that people need to take to um, help themselves in domestic violence situations. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, now we have Kathy Alberti and Stephen Ovenden from Green Mountain RSVP. Good evening, glad to have you here tonight. Good evening, this is Steve Ovenden. Kathy was not able to make it tonight. I'm the volunteer coordinator for Wyndham County RSVP. RSVP is the Senior Volunteer Program for Wyndham County. We're actually part of AmeriCorps Seniors and are sponsored by the Southwest Vermont Council on Aging. RSVP turned 50 this year, and we have had a presence in Southern Vermont since the mid-1980s. We are focused on companionship, transportation, and healthy futures and provide volunteers to the other nonprofits that help area seniors with all their various needs and aging in place assistance. So locally, a volunteer in New Fane has been serving in the vet to vet visitor program that was started through the uh, American Legion post in Brattleboro. Um, we also uh, have utilized that same volunteer has been a driver for Grace Cottage and served some uh, New Fane and other West River Valley residents. Um, volunteers in our area have delivered Meals on Wheels to New Fane residents every week for several years. And we've also provided drivers that have served New Fane residents with medical rides to Grace Cottage and all the way to White River Junction to the VA. A volunteer with Valley Care's SASH program that Joanne just described um, has been doing errands and shopping and helping out a volunteer, or I'm sorry, a, uh, a client in Williamsville, uh, getting her groceries and taking her to medical appointments at Grace Cottage. 
Uh, Great Cottage, um, you know, is is the regional medical center, and so we do a lot of different things with them. Um, our driver program has really given them a lot of abilities to uh, serve people who are isolated without transportation. Uh, some of the other programs that we do is we run a tax aid program that has two sites in Brattleboro and you can, a client can call and get a, uh, a free uh, tax filing with a volunteer that files their taxes for them. And we also do a lot of home visiting with senior solutions. And we can serve any nonprofit that wants to sign up with RSVP. We can usually find a volunteer that'll help just about anything like the Humane Society or the Vermont Association for the Blind or Visually Impaired or hospitals or schools, blood drives. We will do about anything. So that's us in a nutshell. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your presentation. So helpful. Sure. Are there any questions for Steve? Um, the, your acronym, can you explain what the, the acronym stands for? Sure, I should have said that. That's Retired Senior Volunteer Program. Great, thank you. So you guys are the uh, volunteer matchmaker. That's a good way to put it. We are <laughs> a lot like a uh, recruiting and placement agency for senior volunteers. That's wonderful. Great. Are there any other questions? Uh, there Thank you. Oh, Sina, do you have a question? I do. Go for it. Um, I just need to know, how long have you been doing this? Myself, I've been doing it seven years. Oh, okay. But the, the organization itself has been in, in 50. Yeah, um, okay. we started in the late 80s. Late 80s. Okay, so, so New Fame has been involved. I mean, the reason I ask, I, I had a, my, my late grandmother. Um, there, w there was absolutely nothing available when I needed assistance. So I just was wondering how long you've been in service. Yeah, you know, a lot of people will contact us and try to get services directly from us. But like I described, we're a recruiting and placement organization. And we provide volunteers to the nonprofits and then the services come from the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Stephen, for your presentation. We really appreciate you being here this evening. Thank you for your support. You are very welcome. Thank you. And Good night. Next, next, we have Good Gloria night. Christelli with Senior Solutions. I'm glad you made it on tonight, Gloria. Good evening. <laughs> Getting onto Zoom sometimes for me seems to be trickier than it should be, but I think I have it figured out now. Uh, this is a good timing to present on Senior Solutions. As uh, some of you may not know, I'm an appointed representative for Senior Solutions to the Advisory Council, and I represent New Fame in that. As part of that, I have now taken on being a co-chair of the Senior Solutions Advisory Council, so I'm working closely with, I attend the, by Zoom, the board meetings of Senior Solutions as well as the Advisory Council meetings. And it was really good to hear what Steve was saying and realizing that I maybe have a more direct contact with him uh, going forward than I have had. So Senior Solutions, which is the Southern Vermont Council of Aging um, is requesting uh, level funding of $1,150. And we have served the New Fane and Southeastern Vermont since 1973 as the area agency on aging under the Older Americans Act. Oh. 
Now, services include with senior solutions, uh, information and assistance, case management, not so much that somebody goes into the home and does a case management, but there's an overseeing of the needs. Medicare and health insurance counseling. So prior to December 7th, there was a push to get people to call the helpline. Uh, we have an expert on Medicare and they get counseling on what we should do. And we also have health and wellness programs, application assistance, nutrition services, grants for caregiver respite. And that's a more recent, um, so people can apply and actually get paid um, at least a stipend for caregiver respite. We have people who do volunteer visits and there's some flexible funding for unusual special needs not covered by other programs. So that's a lot of information. Then specifically for Newfane, uh, from July 2020 to July of 2021, we handled 102 calls for office visits for information and assistance services and 18 calls for assistance with Medicare. We provided 243 and a half hours of caregiver support, grant assistance and case management support to 26 residents in Newfane. And our volunteers provided three residents with a total of 37, almost 38 hours of volunteer visitation, assistance with errands and or phone calls. We financially supported 3,873 Meals on Wheels delivered to 15 residents by Valley Cares and you know, now being provided through the Dam Diner. Now those volunteer hours, uh, I've been terrible as a volunteer for uh, Senior Solutions. I mix it up with uh, mutual aid and I don't know if the call is really coming because I've received calls from um, Jesse through the SASH program and I go out and I do and I get other people to do and I don't count those. So I'm sure we probably had at least another 30 or more hours because I've taken people as far as um, I had to take a Brattleboro person, not Newfane, but all the way up to Dartmouth Hitchcock to be able to say goodbye to his dying spouse. So, uh, you know, there are things like that that I just never think to put down. You are so, such an incredibly dedicated volunteer for all the services in our town, Gloria. So thank you. And so we trust that, um, you know, a lot of these things, the, the discussion for the mental health issues, uh, we have issues like that that come up and uh, it's just a, a, it's a wonderful organization and I'm, I'm proud to be and pleased that you appointed me as part of it. And we thank you for accepting that. Any questions for Gloria? How many people work with you? Uh, or other than you that are Newfane residents? And that's kind of a weird question, but is it is it people from Newfane who are helping their neighbors or is it people from all over the county who are helping as these volunteers? For Senior Solutions, uh, when I've had volunteers for Newfane, they've been Newfane residents. Great, thank you. And, but, it's me, myself, and I in terms of any group that's working with Senior Solutions specifically. And that's why if I weren't involved with uh, West River Valley Mutual Aid, I'd probably be able to divide out more specifically what's being done for Senior Solutions, but the two merge for me. Gotcha. Well, that would make sense. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you so much for all of your hard work and everything you do. You do wonderful things for our community and thank you for My being pleasure. here and your presentation we really appreciate it happy holidays everybody thank well, you Gloria. and angela don't eat all those cookies okay mm -hmm. i think i made probably 1500 last night so or yesterday <laughs> they're coming out in droves 
<laughs> so next we have Stephen Meyer from Leland and Gray Education Foundation. Good evening, Stephen. Glad to have you here tonight. Hi. Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. Your tree is beautiful in your background. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what was going to be in the background until I flipped you guys on. I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, well, thanks. Um, a little bit Christmassy up here on Wiswell Hill. Yes. Um, once again, we are requesting $1,000 for the Leland Gray Educational Foundation. And I think I've told you this before that um, I wish our founder, Roland Gould, had picked another name because people tend to associate us directly with Leland and Gray. And they say, well, why does Leland Gray need more of our money? But we are distinctly separate from Leland and Gray. We are just share the name. Um, we give a $1,000, no, $4,000 scholarship um, each and every spring to a um, student who's graduating from Leland and Gray. And it's mostly need based, but it's certainly um, that we take into account an interview with them and their academic um, achievements and, and uh, what we would anticipate. Um, you know, academic success in the future. Now, in the past, uh, since our inception in 97, I believe, we've helped 54 students um, and we've given out a total of 100, I believe $134,000. Uh, and what we do is we award $4,000 each spring at graduation. And as long as the student remains in good academic standing, they get $1,000 each year for four years. We don't give it away all at once um, because you know, sometimes the kids don't, you know, they don't last four years in school. Uh, so we're trying to be careful with, with our money. And I think the most important thing that um, we think about is our founders of school really um, tried to watch out for, I don't really want to say the underdogs, but kids who really tried hard, but maybe didn't have all the advantages that other kids had. And um, his heart really went out to, to help kids who um, were really trying to achieve something. In many cases, we give the scholarship to a first generation college student. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had um, kids come back. I keep saying kids, but young, young adults come back mm -hmm. and are now working in the Newbrook Elementary School. St. Michael's Elementary School in Brattleboro, um, Leland and Gray. Uh, there's one working up at Dartmouth Hitchcock in the um, cardio center. Um, they've become CPAs. They, they, they've gone on to, to do um, some really nice professional jobs, both uh, inter uh, nationally and, of course, back here in our community. And that's what we're hoping for is that they come back and they can join our community, become taxpayers, and, and maybe someday sit at the, the new, new fame select board uh, table, become civic leaders. Um, and the other thing I'd like to just touch on is the, uh, my wife's a teacher, and I just hear a lot of, of really tough stories about students and, and what's, what's going on at, at home. My wife, Karen, is a Tiger's Edge teacher, so she, she tends to hear a lot of stories. <laughs> and um, it's really wonderful to know that our community is, you know, helping out and, and giving them a helping hand um, when so much of what they hear today is, is really, it's really tough. Mm -hmm. It's really tough. I had a co-workers say, man, today's young people, in a way, they're just screwed. Well, I don't know if I believe that, but they're, if you listen to the news and listen to social media, it feels that way. So it, it, it really comes from my heart to, to hope that um, New Fane as a community can, can um, continue to support uh, this important mission. And um, most the other towns in the Valley um, also contribute to us. So. Um, that's really our request. Thank you. These children are our future. Yeah. And I would say that two New Fane residents that I knew from their childhood are now back at Leland and Gray teaching, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, they are. It's well, nice. We actually to see. have three alumni that have just come back to the Leland and Gray community that I well, know. Uh, yeah, I checked with Bob Pebo recently, and um, I think there's eight alumni up there working right now. Oh, that's fantastic. And, yeah, and I think a couple of them are recipients of our uh, scholarship, which is nice. Yeah, that is nice. Are there any questions, Christine? Um, it looks like you have um, eight towns that you have given scholarship assistance to. Um, Wyndham, Wordsboro, Jamaica, Brookline, Townsend, Newfane, Dover, and Windhall. Mm -hmm. um, well, yes, over the course of our 23 years, I'm sure that's the case. I cannot promise you each and every year a scholarship will go to a Newfane resident. I just, I, you know, I can't promise yeah. that. Yeah, there's a the past that have fed into the Oh, certainly. Since I was a student, which is just around the same time this was. In. So do you, do you um, ask those towns for um, a don uh, appropriations? We have, and they did not approve it in every town. I believe we asked every town um, several years, well, a few years ago when we had to do the petition and go through the ask at town meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, not every town approved it. A couple of them got kind of sneaky and somehow erased us from the agenda. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I, I can tell you that uh, Jamaica gives $2,000. Uh -huh. We only requested 1000 but there was a gentleman there who put forth the motion to double it and everyone approved it. And it's, <laughs> it's like I couldn't ask for a better gift than that. Nice. Um, and uh, Brookline used to give 500 they give 250 now. Um, Wyndham gives 500. Unfortunately, Townsend was one of the towns that um, got us off the agenda. I grew up in Townsend. My parents or my mom lives in Townsend. Um, there's just, I don't really want to get into the politics of it, but there's just been some animosity between the school and the town for, for years about the town losing its tax base because it's hosting the school and blah 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 they have a hospital they have the towns of dam i don't know I, 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 they, they just didn't approve it yeah so you have a, a scholarship of annually of four thousand and we do and our founder roland gould's two um adult children one lives in ohio and one lives in florida they almost every year also give $500 each for a $1,000 one-time scholarship. So probably for the last 10 years, we've actually given, given um, an extra $1,000 each year um, from, from his family yep. through okay. us. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank okay. you, Stephen. Thank you for being here for your presentation. No, thank, you. Yeah, thank you so much for your support. And you have a good night. Happy holidays. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And next we have Amber Thibodeau from Southern Vermont Therapeutic Writing Center. Good evening, Amber. Welcome. Glad to have you. Hi. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for sticking out to the very end. I have heard from a lot of great organizations tonight, so I appreciate the time to also uh, share with you a bit about SVTRC. Um, so for those that might be unfamiliar, Southern Vermont Therapeutic Riding Center was founded in Newfane at Winchester Stables in 2010. Um, and we currently operate out of um, Brookside Stables in Wilmington, but we are a multi-jurisdictional uh, 501c3 nonprofit. So we provide services to um, residents of Wyndham County and the surrounding area. We have um, participants from Bennington County, um, from Massachusetts, uh, and even from Connecticut right now. Um, so we provide um, equine assisted services to folks with disabilities um, ages four and up. So I have kiddos in elementary school right on up to um, a lady that it just turned 84. Oh, wow. um, and so we work, yeah, <laughs> a wide gamut. And so we work with folks with cognitive, developmental, physical, emotional, special needs, 
Um, and those special needs also run a huge gamut. I work with a lot of kids on the autism spectrum with ADHD or ADD, um, with emotional trauma, uh, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, uh, spinal cord injuries, uh, traumatic brain injuries. Um, so a, a, a wide variety of folks uh, benefit from our services. Um, and so we are requesting appropriations basically to, off, to help us continue our mission. Um, because we serve local residents, um, we want to make sure that our services are affordable to the, the community members. Um, and so we operate, generally speaking, at a loss if we were just to take in participation fees. Um, it costs us uh, roughly $60 to run a half an hour lesson, which is our, our typical um, weekly service. Uh, we provide one lesson per person per week. Um, and it, we ask that participants pay a minimum of $45. Some do pay more than that on a relatively sliding scale. Um, so we do fundraising and grant writing and those types of things all year long to, to make up that difference. Um, so that's, that's basically the, the basis of our ask. Um, so we, we have residents from all over the county right now um and as everybody has mentioned covid but uh we considered briefly shutting down completely um and closing our doors very early on in the pandemic but um through all of the assistance of the paycheck paycheck protection program and other vermont aid um and the generosity of our community we were able to make sure that we stayed open um, um and so we're, we're able to continue our services and hopefully grow. Uh, we work with individuals um, that, that just pay, their family members pay or their self pay kind of thing. We work with local school districts. So we have students that come from Leland and Gray. We've worked with Wardsboro Elementary, Newbrook, um, Twin Valley. Um, we also work with other organizations like Kindle Farm School and Families First, HCRS. Um, to provide our services. That's wonderful. Are there any questions for Amber? Uh, do you have an application? Yes. It's on the back of the packet. I guess I won't get it. It's on the back page of the packet. Oh, on this packet. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, That's wonderful. It's a great stable, too. My daughter went there uh, for helping and riding in her senior year in high school. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Oh, so how many people do they serve here? Two, the past year, two. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a good program. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I mean, I was there for the first one in Mercedes and then had to. Thank you. And I remember the little girls and stuff like his granddaughter had problems. The first time they put her on that horse, I didn't see such a smile of these kids out, you know? Yeah. And And it's uh, it serves um, from young to old. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> Eighty four years old. I've been getting the horse. Yeah. yeah. Any, anything else for Amber? No. Great. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much for for being here and your presentation and all the hard work you do. Oh, thank you for your consideration and thanks for sticking it out to the very end for me. <laughs> no problem. Well, thank you everyone who came for appropriations. We really appreciate all of your presentations and all the hard work that you do for the residents of our town and everyone else. We're ahead of schedule. We are ahead of schedule. <laughs> Good planning. Good planning. <laughs> so with that, we're going to go to unscheduled members of the public. Is there anyone that would like to speak? No. Uh, old business. Uh, do we need to mention the purchase and sales agreement or it's old business? I, I'm not sure how we're doing that. How are we doing with that? Well, um, um, and 
Uh, you're on mute, Ann. I was just going to go to you. <laughs> Thank you. So nice to meet you. Can you just tell me what the status is of the agreement? Um, to, to get back to a lawyer, is that correct? supposed to read the purchase and sales agreement and get back to the one other with any corrections or changes. By and, last Thursday, right? Right, and um, I um, Anne was out of town, so and we received your email today with all of your corrections, which look really good. Are there any others that we'd like to see? Not right off the top of my, uh, but there were all good ones and things that I noticed, and I think we need to have an executive session about it. Okay. Would you like to do that on Monday and hopefully? I don't know where our time, yeah, that would be great, but um, timing wise for getting to the uh, setup. What is the time frame? Where are we at? Do we know? Right off the top? If if you want to incorporate the changes that Anne's already suggested, I can forward them to him to be working on them. Yeah. And then have that draft for you for Monday night. Yeah. Yeah. It would be nice to have the two side by side to see the changes together and then if something more needs to happen. Is I that know. good to go? Should we do that? That works for me. But as far as time with the the, the seller, you if, the if, is the it was 120 days from the 7th of December. So the clock started eight on December 8th. Yeah, we're at so April 5th is the end date. Oh wow, okay. So I think we're doing really well with our timing. Yeah, we have to have it closed before April 5th. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to have the closing before? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So is there a motion to have Juanetta work with Bob on the corrections that were sent out today with Ann and have everything ready to go into executive session on Monday night and discuss? Yeah, that sounds good. Would you like to make that motion? I make that motion. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. I second. Is there, is there any chance I can see it too when uh, they're working on it? Any yeah. further discussion? Yes, Mike, of course you can. We will uh, get that going, and before Monday's meeting, we will have that to everybody for review before the meeting. Yeah, terrific. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, if, well, it will probably come Monday since we approved Moneta to be out Thursday and Friday. So. Right. I think we're, we're in pretty good shape yes. right now. All right, all those in favor say aye. Mike? Aye. 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 Shelly? Yeah, aye. Shelly? Aye. Katie? Aye. Myself? Aye. Thank you for doing that one. Mm -hmm. All right, new business. We have a presentation this evening. We'd like to welcome Meg Gonzalez and Jacob Deutsch, Deutsch from the West River Valley Thrive. Yeah, mm -hmm. Just a second to find my, I lost my agenda and I lost the share. No, I just wanted to vote. Give me two seconds. So I've been a member of the organization, and um, I called Meg up to ask her to give us a presentation um, on the cannabis um, laws for retail in towns. Mm -hmm. And they've already been working on it, so I'm really thankful that they're ahead of the game and they're able to bring us some information. Yeah, uh, well, thank you for having us. Um, I am just going to briefly sort of give you who we are and what we do, and then Jacob's going to take over from there. Um, but just for people who don't know, so West River Valley Thrives is a substance use prevention coalition. Um, we serve the towns of sort of the old Wyndham Central Supervisory Union, so towns in New Fane, Kirkline, Marlboro, Jamaica, Wyndham. Um, and Wardsboro. And we um, lease an office in Leland and Gray, so we have great access to students. We do a lot of program work with the students themselves. We provide um, you know, education, other opportunities. We provide resources and support for teachers. Um, and we're really fortunate to be in the school, but we're not a school-based program. 
And a lot of our work is actually focused on um, the community because it's really important to extend that safety net from what we're supporting the school with into the towns where the, where the students live. So one of the things that we do is we um, help towns identify potential risk factors that would lead to substance use by young people. And while we're here for cannabis today, the cannabis commercialization, it's, it's all substances. We work with um, towns to make sure that retailers are using best practices around um, uh, substance use and sales um, with children. It is um, sometimes we're, we're just helping families um, identify potential risks in their homes and what, what parents need to do to stay responsible. So it's all kinds of things. And it's not just the risks, we're also looking to help support those protective factors. So here in Newfane, you know, what are the things that make Newfane great for raising families here? We want to help support that as well. So we do a, a lot of different types of, of interaction and work with um, the towns and we're, and we're really mandated by the people of the towns that we serve. And so it's really important for us to make connections with residents so that we can really find out what are our local um, conditions here in Newfane and why, how is that different from what we're dealing with in, in Brookline or, or in Marlboro. And, and we know that each town is really unique. So um, our organization does not take a stand one way or another on whether towns should, um, if towns want to opt in um, or opt out for commercial cannabis. And um, what we want to do is really provide you all with what we know to date about uh, the rollout of Act 164. Um, we want to um, provide you with information that we, what we know about um, cannabis in general, and then um, also provide you with information on these cannabis control commissions. Um, that uh, towns can set up in order to be able to have more control over um, commercial sales. So Jacob has put himself in a position to really become uh, an expert um, with some of the committees and working groups that he has um, been on at the state and local and, and county level. So um, I'm going to turn it over to him and he's going to um, give you a little bit of information and then would love to answer any questions that anybody has. Can, yeah. I just, can I just say, when you say cannabis control board, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a liquor board that we are in charge of, too. So yes. That's, that's so there's the cannabis control board, which is at the state level. And that's the governor appointed, legislature appointed board that does all of the major statewide policy, policy decision making. Then Act 164 allows for local municipalities create cannabis control commissions, Commission. too many acronyms, or CCCs, um, that can kind of work like a local alcohol control board or zoning commission, you know, really just a specific group of people at the municipality to take a targeted look at cannabis policy in the town and would be the recommendation-based body that would recommend the select board, what policies to take, whether or not to approve licenses, all of that. But I will dig into that as we go through. Um, this is a very kind of generic overview. If there's any real specifics you want, um, I'll try to answer them as I can at the end. Or if I can't, Meg will write them down and we'll send you an email um, sometime either this week or next week with some answers. Yeah, we'll do questions after you present. That's perfect. Perfect. So. As you all know, um, the Vermont legislature decided to put together a piece of legislation known as Act 164, which allows for the sale and use of recreational cannabis. And the governor decided to allow Act 164 to go into law without signing it. Um, and so that's kind of the complicated legislation process that brought us to where we are today. One really unique thing about the law, though, is Vermont is the first state in the country that requires towns to opt in rather than opt out. Previous states that have allowed towns to have a choice have required them to opt out. During the initial creation of the law, towns had to opt in. I mean, yeah, towns had to opt in by May, or they would kind of be wrapped into whatever the state at large would do, May 2022. However, when the Vermont State Senate kind of reconciled the bill and passed the finalized version, 
that was removed. So it's important to know that there is no deadline for a town to opt in. A town can opt in whenever they want to. Yeah, there was a deadline. There. Yes, there was. And that is no longer in place, which is super important to know because I think originally there was this mad dash that by town meeting day 2022, yeah. every town was going to have to have all their answers solved. Yeah. But um, that's not true anymore, which is great because the Cannabis Control Board um, that the state set up has been heavily delayed due to COVID. Originally, they were supposed to present kind of their finalized legislative recommendations to the legislature last legislative session, and that didn't happen. They didn't even have their board finalized and put together with staff by the end of the last legislative session. Mm -hmm. So while they've been working really hard over the summer and the fall and this early part of winter, and I've been involved in a lot of divergent voices in that conversation from prospective cannabis retailers to prevention organizations like ours and have been doing a really great job, we still don't have a finalized look as to what all the specifics about the law are going to look like because it hasn't been legislature approved and it hasn't even been presented to the legislature wow. yet. So there's a lot of legislative things like how packaging will work, zoning recommendations for whether or not there's going to be any state mandated like buffers between schools. That was so, my question. <laughs> yeah, some questions about taxation, because right now when it comes to the sales and excise tax, only towns with 1% option taxes will get direct sales or excess tax kickbacks. Um, actually, one of the select board members at Brattleboro is part of a group that's trying to push for a restructuring of the way that revenue is shared so towns will get more targeted revenue. So there's a lot of questions that are still kind of at play. So some specifics you might want to ask us, we might just have to say, well, we'll find out with you in the spring. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't know yet. Has this also backed up the um, applying for those permits process? Not yet. So that's one of the things that I'm very curious about because technically applications are supposed to start for various types of licenses as beginning as this spring with yes. rollout of retail cannabis, sales being allowed to start in October of next year. So we do not know if that timeline is gonna be pushed back or yet. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest in both directions, yes. so we'll see what happens. But as of right now, um, applicants can start applying in the spring. Now, it is important to know that there are five different types of licenses. Towns only have a choice to vote over two of them, which are the standard retail license or an integrated license. An integrated license is a license that combines every other license. It's medical, it's retail, it's commercial, like wholesale manufacturing, it's growing, and it's Man. testing. Chemistry labs. Right? Yeah, and it's testing all in one place. Now the state capped the amount of those licenses allowed to five, I believe. Um, we were kind of working with the Jamaica Select Board and the town of Jamaica through this process, and they ultimately decided to do their vote in two pieces, one vote for retail and one vote for integrated. In Jamaica, retail passed, integrated did not. Um, but towns do not have a say whether or not testing or manufacturing can happen in their towns. That's just automatically allowed. Automatically allowed? Yep, like any other business. So there could be a wholesaler built, you know, down the street somewhere in New Fane, and that's not something that would have to be approved by the select board. It is just the retail and the integrated that are currently allowed to be um, voted on by towns. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. five per state or five per Five state? for the state. state. So yeah. the problem with the integrated license that some people have is that it's been limited to a lot of large corporations rather than I think what people, some of the language some people have used for it is more like, I'm not a big fan of the language, but more farm to table type thing that you know your local farm would be able to grow and then also yeah, yeah. sell it For and sure. currently that is not allowed under the way that the law is written okay. so that sort of hinders people that really do have the wherewithal to do all of those things yes so right now if you wanted to open a retail store 
your retail, so you would have to buy from a wholesaler. Um, you cannot grow it yourself and then sell it at your retail store because those are two separate licenses and you're allowed to have both unless you have one of those five integrated licenses. So that's one of the tricky things about the laws is we still don't know a lot yet about what some of this might look like because we don't have an answer to whether or not integrated laws are going to get changed and we don't have an answer to some of the tax structure. So while a municipality would definitely get, you know, the extra money from having a new building and, you know, new employees potentially in town, there's none of the direct excise tax or sales tax is going to kick back to the town unless you have that 1% option tax. Um, wow. So like Brattleboro, you know, they'll get their 1% just like they will for everything else. Go for also. Yeah, but... Um, I don't think Jamaica has a 1%, so they won't be. Um, and so that's kind of what's going on with some of the larger policy questions. We still don't know a lot about timeline. There's those five different licenses. Towns can vote on two. It's opt-in with no deadline. And there's a lot of questions about taxation. Hopefully some of that will be clarified in the spring. One thing that we do know is that Act 164 allows for something called cannabis control commissions. Originally, these were created by the state to kind of be the rubber stamping, you know, license approval mechanism for local municipalities. But some municipalities have decided to make these more thought groups of varying voices to be able to discuss like issues of zoning um, at a local town level, major cannabis policy issues. Things like, should we create our own buffer? You know, what kind of zoning, do we need to reevaluate our zoning at, you know, at large in order to accommodate this? Because there are a lot of specific challenges. You can't target a specific cannabis institution and say like, cannabis retailers aren't allowed to be open past, you know, 8 p.m., right? Wow. Because that's against their freedom of speech. Yeah. yeah, you can't create specific signage regulations that say that just cannabis institutions can't have any kind of signage, right? So it requires a delicate touch if you do want to, you know, approach retail cannabis from a more prevention lens. And that's why we think it's important to have these cannabis control commissions. And one of the packets we handed out, there's a, a sample of who could potentially be on there that ranges from, you know, people involved in the school to parents to members of the church to, you know, people interested in owning cannabis establishment to people like us interested in the prevention lens somebody from the zoning commission to really make sure that there's divergent voices tackling these issues from all sides. Um, and again, those can look at a large number of topics like density measures, you know, how many can be had in a town? What does the zoning look like? What does the signage look like? And can also become, you know, kind of the municipality's policy experts on the topic. It's a really complex law. There's a lot we still don't know. And ideally, you know, a town could create a cannabis control commission even before they do their vote to opt in or out. That way they have a, you know, kind of their own think tank doing a lot of this research and starting to have some of these discussions, you know, before there's ever even a decision to opt in. So if a town does decide to opt in, they already know, you know, this is how we want to approach it. Or a town can decide, you know what, we don't want to opt in because of XYZ, or maybe we won't opt in unless XYZ changes at the state level. So our one recommendation that we would put out is definitely consider you know, can, having a cannabis control commission at some point in time. As far as our role at Thrives, obviously we come at this whole issue from a prevention lens. The data has shown that in places that legalize retail cannabis, youth perception of harm goes down, and the National Institute of Health has shown that as perception of harm goes down, youth use rates go up. Um, so, you know, we would definitely like to make sure that if retail cannabis does happen in New Fang, that it is at least done in a thoughtful, intentional way, with as many safeguards put in place to protect youth and people in recovery as possible. As far as our role, we're happy to help out as much as possible when it comes to asking questions, Answer questions, sorry. If we don't know the answer, we can typically find somebody that does. Um, 
and are also happy to come to as many of these types of meetings as necessary. Mm -hmm. For example, when Jamaica had their revote earlier this fall, we attended a handful of select board uh, meetings and then presented at their informational session. So we're more than happy to you know, come back as many times as you need us. And if you have any specific questions or any specific issue you want us to do a deep dive into, like taxation, that's definitely something that we would be able to do. Um, I have one quick clarifying question. Is yep. this for these stores, are they for people 18 and up or 21, 21 and up? Yeah. Okay. And so right now, an important thing to know about the retail cannabis is that you can't have just like a country store and then also have retail cannabis. Mm -hmm. They have to be separate. Right now, there's no law to allow something more standard to like, you know, the country store plus liquor store model. Yeah. That currently does not exist. Gotcha. So say the new fame store wanted to do this, they would have to have like a separate building that's technically, you know, a separate business to run it out of. Anne had a question. I wanted to understand the uh, process for opting in or not. Is it typically a decision of a select board or I had the sense that it was being done in most municipalities by going out to the voters of the town and having a town-wide meeting, a town-wide vote? Yeah, so that for me? we've seen it happen multiple ways. So sometimes it's been a petition process where, you know, according to the town charter, um, you know, there needed to be a petition and it needed to be discussed at town meeting day. You know, other times the select board was the one who put it on the agenda for town meeting day, or sometimes like in the case of Jamaica, it's been its own special vote um, at the town resident level. So it really depends on your specific laws, processes, and the way that the select board wanted to approach it. The day that most towns have opted in was town meeting day. Town meeting day was, um, there have been a handful of opt-ins and opt-outs since town meeting day, but the majority of the votes in 2021 happened at town meeting day. Um, any other I questions? have another question. Um, as far as looking at the models of, you know, how towns are laid out, um, would New Fame be a good location or bad location uh, for such a place? Um, in, res in in considering that the elementary school is way over there versus Townsend, which has both an elementary school and high school, they have a square in the middle of their town. Yeah. So it, as far as that goes, I think that's more up to the town residents. But our our stance would be that New Fane is definitely an interesting situation because of all the typical things that are put into buffer zone you know, ideas, when people envision what a buffer zone would look like, mm -hmm. right? They typically think about churches, schools, playgrounds, and, you know, public spaces like the Newfane Green, right? Mm -hmm. And so, at least as far as this downtown stretch, if, you know, Newfane wanted to have those specific types of buffers in place, it would be hard to get something kind of right here on, on the main strip. Mm -hmm. um, and from our perspective, again, having it right by the elementary school across from the church, you know, definitely has the potential to decrease youth perception of harm, um, which leads to issues. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, on, on the whole, we would definitely say that we're here to support the town no matter what you decide. You know, if the town did decide to opt in, we aren't going to suddenly vanish away. We want to make sure that you know, it, it would be done intentionally and that those things were brought into consideration during the process. But we're ultimately here to follow the mandate from the select board and from the people of New Fane. So we'll help no matter what the town decides. Do you have any statistics on the kids that live here in New Fane regarding, you know, substance abuse or anything specifically? Yes, so I don't have all of it on me right now, but I can send it to you. But um, all the data we have on youth in New Fane is specifically from the Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey, and it is for the entirety of the supervisory union in the West River Valley. There's also county level data, but we really only rely on the supervisory union data just because our local conditions are so different from the residents in Brattleboro. 
And the thing that we do know is that, you know, both at the state level, here in Wyndham County, and at our supervisory level, um, youth cannabis use is increasing, youth perception of harm is decreasing, and perhaps the most worrying to us is that the frequency of youth's use is the thing that is going up the highest. So when it comes to the number of youth who report 30-day use, and within that, you know, using 20 plus times in 30 days, those are the numbers that are specifically increasing that we find worrying. Hmm. It's not like an occasional whatever, it's someone that's yeah, so the, hooked on it. Yeah, so the questions of potential you know, physical or emotional dependence and the frequency of youth are alarming on our end. But you know, the key message we like to put out is that the majority of youth aren't using, and that's you know, a, a real positive and something that we want to make sure it is put out there. It's really easy to get caught up when we talk about the negatives, but, yeah. you know, the majority of our youth aren't using oh. and, you know, aren't partaking illegally. So that's great. Is it my understanding that those rates have gone down since the 90s for like fairly steadily? For youth use of cannabis? For use, yeah. So they fluctuate a lot. And, you know, the YRBS survey isn't always... It's only done every two years. Um, we just got the 2021 data and we can send that all to you with our the charts that we have that kind of show use youth, I think since 2011 is how far back our specific mm -hmm. supervisory yes. level data yeah. goes. So we can definitely supply you all with that afterwards. I honestly should have printed it out and brought it with us. Yeah. But um, we have that and we can send that to you as early as tomorrow morning. Great, so. thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I think years ago, I, I, I'm not sure how you guys came about, but I remember being up in Townsend area and knowing that there was a high risk of substance abuse. And there was a lot of money that came through the cigarette um, lawsuit that funded this abuse or substance abuse and, you know, in this area. And I, I want to say the Valley. Oh, they imposed a tax yeah. in 1997 where if you were caught underage with a cigarette, it was a $20 fine per cigarette. So if you had a full pack, it was $200. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yep, I remember that I'm clearly. Say. <laughs> but um, so your funding, was it originally from that um, fund? Or? Uh, I, I was just going to say that. The funding that has sustained us for most of our history has been federal funding through the Drug Free East Community Grant, which is currently provided through the CDC. So that is where the large majority of our funding comes from. And then we share some funding with our Wyndham County um, Prevention Partnership, who we created some of the documents we handed out to you with. Mm -hmm. um, that comes from the state. Mm -hmm. And we also have specific tobacco, tobacco control. Tobacco, yeah. yeah. And um, because I, I know that uh, raising a son in this area, there was a high risk of abuse, substance abuse, um, historically, in comparison to other areas around here. Yes, so Vermont, first and foremost, has the highest youth cannabis rate uses of any state in the country. Um, and Wyndham County in particular does have an average higher use substance to use rates than surrounding counties. And something important to bring into the discussion is that, you know, when we, when we discuss youth substance use, the things we like to talk about are protective factors and risk factors. And things like the lack of transportation, which the mover was here hoping to try to address potentially by adding that new line, um, you know, that's a big risk factor right now. There's not a lot of transportation. There's not a lot of third spaces. And some of our work is by trying to create protective factors by building sense of place, by partnering with places like the More Free Library, the Townsend Library to, you know, create programming for, for youth so that there are other, you know, kind of constructive alternatives because there is a lot of use here in the higher those risk factors are, whether it's because of, you know, the family struggling at home, you know, inattentive parents, 
maybe the kid's LGBTQ plus and is facing some discrimination for that. Those kind of risk factors lead to higher rates. And we're here to try to make sure that, you know, our community is really rallying around to decrease those risk factors and to increase as many protective factors to protect our youth, provide them with safety, stability, and connection as possible. So, great. so I know we gave you a ton of materials. Yes. So if you have any specific questions after mulling them over, you know, just let us know and we'll get back to you however we can. Did you hand out the folders that we have? Yeah, I handed out the folders already. Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the um, vehicle accident yes. list? That has decreased or appears to be decreasing. But yeah. I don't know if there's an age group or if that's everyone or... So that's from Mark over at the Sheriff's Office. And that was decreasing because it was only halfway through the year. So that was 2021 as of, I think, October. Um, so that's important to know. But really the key thing in there is um, Mark's on our board and he provided that to us just to kind of show some of the fatality data that we now have because there is no potential and technology for officers to conduct some kind of testing for cannabis after you know potential DUIs are seen. And what we have seen based off of that data is that a significant amount of both the accidents that have involved, the fatality accidents that have involved drugs, a high percentage of those, the drug has been cannabis, and a high percentage of the accidents that have happened due to alcohol in combination with other drugs, the other drug has been cannabis. So that's just something, you know, we do a lot of work with the various sheriff's departments about inebriated driving. So we just think it's important to put those statistics out there, not just about cannabis, but about, you know, everything, because the more we can do to reduce inebriating driving, the safer our roads are gonna be. I mean, just for our town, if we don't have that 1%, there's no, there's no, we can't collect any money or, you know, so, what's the purpose? So the only, so the town would still collect some revenue. The revenue would come from, if there are additional employees, you know, you'd get any taxes through that and the standard business taxes and then you would technically get some of the licensing fee. So as of right now, the way it's gonna work is once a license is submitted, the state will collect the fee and then distribute back the municipalities for Shin later. Now that's not very much money at all, but there is some money um, through those mechanisms. It is just, I think people see the high excess tax percentage, which I think is 13, 14%, something like that, and assume that the towns are gonna to be rolling in all this yeah. excess tax, and as of right now, that is not the way that the law is set up. And what's the time frame in which New Bay has to decide whether they opt in or opt out? Never, as of right now. So again, there's a, yeah. yeah, so originally, when it was just passed by the House, um, there was the requirement of a May 2022 decision and if towns didn't opt in um, or opt out they would kind of be wrapped into whatever the state deemed appropriate for everyone else we don't know what that would have looked like and luckily the state senate took that out and really left the decision in the hands of local municipalities there was just an article on the reformer that that you sent me the link to that came out today or yesterday yeah, about the Brattleboro Select Board member yeah, who's no, pushing to change the revenue structure um, at the state level to ensure that local municipalities get more direct funding. But I think a lot of questions are going to be answered during the sludge season. I know we were really worried about this potential May deadline when that was originally discussed because we didn't know what was going to, you know, there's still so much we didn't know at that point that we were like, how on earth are towns going to be able to make informed decisions? You know, while we're very neutral on this, our idea would definitely be at least wait till after, you know, we have more of those answers from the legislature. Because right now, the way we think about it is a vote to opt in is kind of right in a blank check. You don't know exactly what you're going to get. You don't know exactly, you know, how any of the things are going to work out. For example, the official mechanism of how the state is going to collect license and fees and then distribute that out 
back to towns, yeah. which is never done before, hasn't even been figured out yet. Right. Who's responsible for that isn't finalized. So our you know thing would definitely be wait for more information, but you know we're here Do to help. Do they have an imposed deadline that they're working with now? I, I think ASAP. Right. They're they're trying to get this done as soon as possible. I know at least the Cannabis Control Board is. They've been really proactive this summer, like I said, trying to publish some of their like, here's where we kind of stand, right? And, you know, working things out by having a bunch of individual working groups. Mm -hmm. And they'll be presenting all of that. Um, there's not, as far as I know, a finalized date for that that's been determined. But at some point, they'll present to the legislature, hopefully in January, and we'll get a clearer picture of exactly what everything looks like. Great. Uh, um, you know, I, I have nothing. Uh, I managed a 20,000 square foot building down in Broadway that had the first cannabis medical marijuana um, uh, business. And we never had any issues at the building. Um, and they didn't either. It was mostly older people for medical reasons. I understand it's an herb, you know, or, you know it's an old. You know, it could be used for a lot of different things, hemp, rope, whatever. Um, but it does have, you know, certain um, health benefits. Um, is there anything that uh, if we were to allow someone to come in with that type of um, restriction that it was only for medical? So the state already allows for medical cannabis. So that is already in there. This does not affect medical dispensaries. So we could have a medical dispensary here all right now. Yeah, that, that's already allowed. So like, for example, there's one in Manchester that I know of. I think there's one in, in Brattleboro. Yeah. But medical has been allowed for a while now in Vermont. We just never dealt with it here. Yeah. You know. And so that that's not affected. That is one of the things that integrated licenses would allow the you know, a holder of the integrated licenses would be able to also do medical in addition to retail and the plethora of other things, but. But they would, but also the, separate from that, if they, we could have a medical. Just medical right now. Cannabis yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. Versus, um, uh, uh, you were talking a shopping center. <laughs> yeah. And, and, a store. And so know? one important thing to note is both any retail cannabis store would be limited to 21 and up. They would be bound by some state restrictions for signage, but any license that is approved gets grandfathered in if a town later decides to opt back out. So if a town does opt in at some point, they can decide, whoa, 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 not anymore. We don't accept any more licenses and opt out. But any existing um, cannabis retailers would be grandfathered in in perpetuity. So again, it's kind of like a, once you do it, you can kind of, you can stop it from getting bigger, but you can never go back. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of information to take in. <laughs> yeah, it's been a blast. <laughs> a great presentation too, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, when we're happy to help with any clarifying questions, you know, it would be great if you wanted to have us back sometime, if you could pre-send us some of those questions that way we could make sure that we're really able to provide detailed responses to whatever your yeah. specific questions are. I have one last one. Is, yep. is the Vermont legislation looking at neighboring states like Massachusetts and their current legislation and how they've dealt with it? Or is it because it's a commonwealth, it's a totally different animal? So that's something that people from all sides have been trying to do. Kind of the, you know, people from the, cannabis retailer side of things or trying to use the models that are most retailer friendly people from kind of prevention side of things are trying to use the most prevention friendly models mm -hmm. and the state's kind of trying to figure out what works best for us now i would say that the model that's been used the most in our discussions would probably be massachusetts just because it is the most you know it's also pretty new and it's right there you know it's very Western Mass and Southern Vermont have some pretty similar local conditions. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say a lot of people have been looking at how that's going, um, but they also have some interesting provisions that we don't. Like I think that they currently allow retail cannabis delivery. 
And obviously they also have billboards, which is a big thing. So there is some different context that we currently don't have. But, you know, with every state that has passed retail cannabis since Colorado has really used, you know, every other state as models and tried to pick and choose what they think would work for them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and for being here. We look forward to more information as we get more. <laughs> and if anyone has any further questions that they want to pass to the group, they can email, email you. Yeah. yeah. At... It's right there on the front of the cover. WR, WRBT director at gmail.com. Yep. And a phone number is 802-365-4700 for West River Valley Thrives. Yeah. So I'm sure we will have you back in the near future for some more information. We'd be happy to do it. Thank you so much for yes, Thank you. Are there any more questions? Anybody else up there? Just a couple. Great. Well, once again, thank you so much. You have a lot to learn too, and we'll be back in touch. <laughs> All right. Next, we have the mask mandate pursuant to state law S. One. And Anne, if you wouldn't mind telling us about your email today. Okay. So the state has now approved uh, a few weeks ago. The governor will not uh, mandate masks statewide, but he said that each individual town can decide what they want to do. Uh, the LCT then wrote two model mandates that towns can use as a basic structure. One um, form of the um, rule allows you to invoke penalties if somebody um, does not follow the law. Another version is no penalties. I looked at what different towns are doing in both Brattleboro and in Wilmington to date. They have voted to make masks uh, required in all public spaces throughout the town. Uh, we received a letter from one of the um, a grocery Association, I'm sorry, I forget the exact name of the organization in a moment, but they were saying that if you're going to mandate it, please make sure that you have some ability to enforce. Um, to enforce it rather than leaving it to the store owner, which I think is a very fair point. So what I would like to propose is a very um, modest mask mandate that would cover two situations. One, cover the town office so that all business um, at the, conducted at the town office would require masks. And I would like to suggest that we also include any kind of public meeting called by the select board uh, would require masks. Uh, that Had we had such a law in place, it would have covered the situation that we ran into with our last special town meeting. Um, I think with the very rapid rise in COVID cases, especially here in Vermont, but um, really all over, I was just in New York City and while I was down there, the case numbers were just going through the roof and it was really quite frightening what was going on um, with the number of um, people who were contracting either the Delta variety and now the Omicron uh, variety of COVID. So I think this is a fairly modest proposal. Um, I think that according to the law, it, it can only be put in place for 45 days. Prior to the end of the 45 days, we can vote to extend it for another 30 days. And the ultimate end of uh, the mandate is allowed if a town chooses to make a mandate. You can only go until, I think it was April 22nd. I forget the exact date, but a date in April. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that with the rapid rise of COVID that 
perhaps the state will come up with some more um, variations or extensions to this law. I have no idea though. Um, but I would just say, at least for our town, that I think this would be a help to start. Um, I personally would be very curious to hear what businesses in our town think and what they might want, um, if they want anything more than that. And I would, um, if, if people agree, I would be happy to call a couple of businesses and just try and get some input on what people are thinking and what what businesses would want. But at a minimum, I would propose that the select board vote in favor of a mandate for our town offices and for any um, town meetings. And again, this would only cover the next 45 days. Anyone have anything to say? Well, I don't know about that, you know, this whole town meeting thing, because, I mean, it's just like it's the meeting we just had, there was quite a few people that didn't, that didn't want to have to wear a mask. I mean, I mean, I think that um, I don't, I'm not in favor of making it mandated throughout the whole town either. I mean, I think it's up to most businesses. They'll mark that down if they want them in there with a mask or without. I mean, I don't like where I have to tell people they have to wear something like this. And everything else. I mean, it's just like they're having a problem with the vaccination. You know, some people do it, and everything else. A lot of people do. A lot more people I think would do it, but then for one of the government telling them they have to have it. Um, and like I said, this last meeting, you know, when we had the gravel thing, there was quite a few people adamant they did not want to wear a mask, and um, they got just as much right to vote as the one who's got the mask. I mean, it's almost like you're making two sides, you know, when you do something like this. I really think that it should be, a, it's up to the person. If they want to put a mask on, let them wear the mask. The ones that they don't want to wear the mask, that's up to them. Um, I think another thing is, I mean, it's like I said, when we first, when this whole thing took effect, the COVID thing, they told you the only mask that really made a difference was the N95. And now everybody's got these little blue masks, a little black mask or cloth mask or something like that. And they, they say they really are not effective. And um, so if they're not effective, why are they making us all wear them, you know? I mean, I'm not, in you know, if you, you stay six and a half feet away from each other. Well, it's not hard to stay six feet from the, the next person, you know? So I just think that, you know, I'm not in favor of saying anything about a mandate and telling people they have to do it because if, we, if you can put down, we suggest, we, you know, Masks are required, but not, you know, mandated or whatever. I mean, it's, a lot of stores are doing it that way. You go in a store, some people got them, some people don't. Um, I just think it should be up to the person. Thank you, Mike. Um, this is not a requirement for the whole town, the proposal that Ann was making. It was just for the no, town, no, I the just for the town the office. Meeting. Right, yeah. a special meeting. Right, and we have had this. Yeah, there's a lot of people at that last meeting that was adamant they did not wear, they want, that they didn't want to wear a mask. Now, it's been a shame that they couldn't have came and vote, you know, just because they didn't want that mask. Yeah, I, I, I think there's enough people that have been vaccinated or haven't been vaccinated. They can wear a mask, they can wear whatever they need to self protect or from other people. But at this point, I think it's a it's our own personal decision. We've managed to put along in the cases. It's like the flu. We're, we're, everyone's going to have COVID at one point or another, and it's about um, a level, a percentage of what uh, zero point one two three whatever uh, chance of dying from it. Uh, it's an extreme. You know, we're going on two years now. And, and yes, there are people that die from COVID. There's people who die from heart attacks. There's people who die from flu. There are people that die from drugs. You know, it's, it's, it, I, I don't think you need to mandate it. Uh, you know, I'm being respectful. People can be respectful. Um, if they don't want to wear a mask, then, you know, I think that's, uh, they're right not to wear a mask. 
I would agree with residents and businesses, but not for our town dealings, because there are people who did not come and could not exercise their right to vote because they refused to be around folks who were not masked for their own safety. And that is one right to not wear a mask does not trump someone else's right to vote. And with that, I would like to bring in our two letters of correspondence, if that's okay, regarding this subject. Is that okay? Is it for from outside people or something? One is from Gloria Cristelli and one is from Lynn Forrest. Regarding masks. Is it okay with the board if I read the correspondence? Well, I mean, these are pers personal opinions. I think we need to, you know, look at it more on a uh, level of, you know, our office here, which we've done. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been able to provide Zoom for people who don't want to be here in person but want to attend the meeting. So I think it's really a select board decision in Okay. I mean, that's my per personal opinion. I read the letters. I don't, you know. Okay. I think everyone has their own personal opinion on it. I think as a governing body, we've done, we've not had a mandate. We've had a suggestion to wear masks. We've made it a requirement to wear masks when coming in to this, to the, to the town offices. Town offices. And for some down. time, yeah. and that was to early on. That was right. early before we knew stuff. Yeah, that was in October. We reinstated it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, what has been given to us as a proposal as of today's date for the town of Newfane to require wearing face coverings indoors in the town offices and for indoor public meetings held by the select board? Do you want me to read this proposal? in its entirety, or do we want to just go into a motion? So where was the proposal from? I would recommend reading it for the record. Okay. So if anyone is listening or uh, listens to the video afterwards, they know what it says. I will go ahead and do that. Proposed as of December 20th, 2021, Town of New Bay, Vermont, rule requiring wearing face coverings indoors in public spaces. Section 1, Authority. This rule is adopted by the Select Board of the Town of Newfane under Authority of Act 1, an act relating to temporary municipal rules in response to COVID-19. Section 2, Purpose. The purpose of this rule is to require all individuals to wear face coverings while conducting business at Newfane's town offices and during any indoor public meetings in the Town of Newfane called by the Newfane Select Board in order to prevent and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and protect the public health and safety of the town of Newfane. Section three, requirement to wear face coverings. All individuals in the town of Newfane shall wear face coverings while at the Newfane town offices and during any indoor public meetings in the town of Newfane called by the Newfane Select Board. Section four, exceptions. Face coverings not required for children under two years. Section five, other laws. This rule is in addition to all other ordinance and rules of the town of Newfane and all applicable laws of the state of Vermont. All ordinances, rules, or parts of ordinances, rules, resolutions, regulations, or other documents inconsistent with the provisions of this rule are hereby repealed to the extent of such inconsistency. Section six, severability. If any section or provision of this rule is held by a court of competent jurisdiction to be invalid, such findings shall not invalidate any other part of this rule. Section 7, Effective Period. This rule shall take effect immediately upon the approval by the Select Board and shall remain in effect for a period not to exceed 45 days following its initial adoption. The Select Board shall meet during the 45-day period in which this initial rule is in effect and vote either to rescind this rule or to extend it for an additional 30 days. Thereafter, the Select Board shall meet at a minimum once every 30 days to reconsider this rule, at which meeting the Select Board shall vote either to rescind this rule or to extend it for an additional 30-day period. The filing of a petition under 24 VSA section 1972 and 1973 shall not govern the taking effect of this rule. 
I would just um, like to add one more comment, sort of reiterating what Katie said. Pete, there were many people who did not come to our um, special uh, town meeting because they either live with young children who are too young to be vaccinated or they have health conditions that do not allow them to take any chance of being um, increased chance of, of, of contracting COVID and uh, being with people without masks uh, can increase the probability of catching COVID. So I think that it's a, I really would stress that I think this is a, a very modest proposal. It's for very limited uh, situations where uh, people would be asked to wear masks, even if they don't like to, even if it's against their, um, their principles or, or any other reasons that they might have, but it protects um, those people who otherwise are being left completely out of the um, deliberative processes of the town. To include our town clerk who did not come to the special town meeting right. because of that fact. And That's she is correct. here every day except Friday, so we have to, we should be thinking of the folks who work here as well. To that end, I wanted to ask if we need to include the BCA, don't they preside over the meetings? Do we need to include Sorry, that? Say that again, Kate. The BCA, we had to vote. We the had board to have of civil authority. The, we had to hold a meeting for the Board of Civil Authority to elect right. Gloria Cristelli to preside over the meeting. Do we need to include the BCA in Section 2, called by the New Fang Select Board and or the BCA, in order to prevent and mitigate, to, to fully make sure that we are covered? Our bases I are covered. I don't know. There's probably no harm in adding it, but I think it's a select board that calls a meeting and the BCA that is the presiding officer for the vote. Okay. So I think it still comes on the jurisdiction of the select board, as I understand it. Should we clarify that before we do it again? Sign it? Yeah. We can still vote at this point, but with that yes or no. We'll clarify that point, yes. Great. So at this point, is there a motion to accept this proposal? I make a motion, uh, a motion to accept this proposal with the clarification of whether the BCA needs to be included and have it for 45 days and renewed 30 days as needed until the S1 wears out as proposed on April 30th, 2022 or thereafter. Is there a second? A second. Any further discussion on the proposal? Is there public discussion allowed? Yes, George. Yes. Yeah, so it's like in the uh, Mike, just to me, Mike. George Brown is going to speak. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, um, a couple of things. One, I want to congratulate the, the board on solving that very tough situation you were put into. I know I was part of the reason you were put in that situation. Um, and, you, and you solved it. And you. You allow people, not just people who are masked and concerned, but also people who are unmasked to come and participate in a vote. Um, so so we, you, didn't, you didn't discriminate against anybody's good faith beliefs and what they felt. Wow. And that worked out great. And I encourage you to continue to do that. Um, obviously, I don't like wearing a mask. I'm wearing one today because this is the standard here. And I get it. I totally get it. Um, you gave me an option to go on to um, Zoom meetings and participate. That was never given at the other meeting, right. which is why that happened. Right. And luckily it happened the day of, the day before, instead of the day of, because there would have been, that vote never would have been allowed to happen. I think we can agree on that. Um, other than that though, going forward, I hope that you'll continue to think about the people who have those good faith beliefs that are different. Um, and you'll find options. I know there's a town, the, the, um, town meetings coming up and there's a lot of people who won't go to that if they have to wear a mask. I, I don't know how you guys talk about these things, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so I'm hoping you'll do that and I hope you'll give it consideration to the people here that pay taxes and want to participate 
and they want to vote. So yay and nay votes aren't going to be able to happen on a Zoom meeting. It's just not going to be able to happen. So if you want me to be able to participate, or if I want to be able to participate, I should be able to show up to the meeting, cast a paper vote, or whatever the situation is. I get it. I, some people have different fears than I do, and I, I respect that. Mm -hmm. um, but the government shouldn't be practicing control over my feelings. So I'll leave it at that, and I, and I encourage you to continue doing what you did. You did the right thing. You solved the problem. That's what we elected you to do. Right, it's pretty great. Thank you. Thank you, George. We really appreciate you being here tonight. Anne? Just wanted to say that um, while we did resolve it for that meeting, the result was a lot of people who um, could did not join because masks were not mandated and it became a health concern for them. So it, it wasn't really um, ideal. the best solution town-wide, in my opinion. What I would like to find out is, I would like to look at our town, um, it's not a charter, but our town rules, regulations, whatever it is, to uh, change whatever it is that says that things have to be done from the floor on a voice vote or paper vote, and instead be able to change our uh, governing rules so that we can always do votes by Australian ballot. Because if our rules had been different, let's say for the last uh, special town meeting, we could have had a town meeting where everyone participated via Zoom, but then all voting was done over, let's say, a eight, 12 hour period by Australian ballot. And that, I think, would have been the very best solution. Um, and I'm curious whether or not that is something that we can do for town meeting um, as a possibility. So those are some of the things I would like to look yeah. into. And um, if I could just then ask Winnetta, if you could send me a copy. I know I asked you about, I thought we were chartering to send me the charter agreement, and for some reason, there is a proposed charter on the um, town website. If you could send me what our governing rules are, whatever that document is, so I could look to see what would need to be changed and bring it here to the select board to discuss. Okay. We're not a charter. We're not a, we're not not a, a charter. charter. We're, we're not, not a charter. But there is something, there happens to be something on our website that is a proposal for a charter that I imagine, there was no date on it, so I don't know when it was proposed, but um, it probably should be taken off our website. That would probably be wise. <laughs> okay. I, I know speaking with Carol, the only thing that we currently can vote Australian ballot for is the election of officers. Yeah. Which is- I understand, but yeah. I think other towns have changed their rules so that they um, can do all votes by Australian ballot. Okay. That's my understanding from something that the LCT said to me. Is Australian ballot different than remote so, ballots, which you can do in advance, long, long in advance? Like, like that's been- You remote. mean like absentee ballot? Absentee ballots, thank you. That's the word I was looking for. But that doesn't work for town meeting for no. I think the absentee decisions. ballots only cover those Australian voting articles. Articles. Okay. Which are the election of the officers. I don't think I don't think they would incur the thirty seven articles for appropriation general and elections. budget and all that. I've only seen it like in general elections when oh, presidential oh, stuff is done. A lot of town meeting by be, Australian be, Because of the COVID Right. mandates that were in place at that time so I everything was done by that so i understand ann's asking if we can change how wherever that's written in our town blah we'll leave out the word <laughs> charter and include australian ballots forever which i think is not a terrible idea i mean if it's well the whether you want to call it australian ballot or do, okay. pardon it depends on what the state allows us to do well, right. But and that way we, we are not in the position of where we were the last time. Uh, we have a question from Sina. Hey, Sina. Hi. Hey, listen, I just had a, I, first of all, I wanted to say, Anne, it's nice to see your face because I really would not have ever recognized you. 
um, other than Zoom. Um, I know Angela and Katie, um, Juanita, I don't know you. I would not recognize you because of your mask. Um, <laughs> it's, it's sad. I mean, it really is sad. The gentleman who spoke tonight about the cannabis stuff, no clue. Those, the, the gentleman and the woman would not recognize him if they ran into me in the street. Mm -hmm. it, this, this mask thing is just, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very frustrated with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's okay to attend the Zoom meetings. I almost wish that if you're going to go with the mask thing, everybody go to Zoom so we can actually talk to people's faces and not... I, I sit there and I have to look for hand motions to see who's talking because if you don't, don't show your hands, I don't know who's saying what. Katie, I don't recognize your voice behind the mask. <laughs> and I, it, it's sad because there's so many times I'm sitting there looking like, I don't know who's talking. I have no idea who's saying what. I actually commented tonight. It was becoming gargled. I, I didn't understand stuff. And I'm just sitting here going like, this is just kind of a waste. And I understand you guys are for the people. And <laughs> this is kind of ridiculous. I, I, I don't know, my, that's my opinion. And I feel bad because I would love to be part of the town. There's people that I do know and that I do recognize, and I'm glad to see them on Zoom because I get to see their full face. So, you know, and I recognize Mike's voice. And I know Mike, <laughs> but like I said, listening to you guys, I, I don't know who's talking. I appreciate the hand gestures because that's all I know who's, who's saying what. So that's pretty much it. Thank you, Zena. So there's a motion. Can I say something here? Yes, Mike. I mean, I agree with George 100%. I mean, you guys are saying, again, there's a lot of people that didn't really come to vote because they didn't care to go there because so there were some people on that. You know, I think the whole thing is, but just like I said, when we were finding that thing up for that meeting, I mean, it was an hour, I think I had some guys, if people in the mask want to sit on one side, the people on the other side want to be without the mask. It was almost, you know what it kind of reminds me of, I mean, this whole thing? It almost reminded me of, and I'm not prejudiced whatsoever, but it kind of reminded me of, like, back in the 50s and 60s, when this was a black sat on this side of the room and the white sat over here. I mean, that's just, like, the, all I could think of, people in there that had the mask on, to see the one without the mask, like, glaring at the other guy, they have these, you know, these guys are the ones that caused all this trouble. The whole thing with the mask is, the one thing I can say is they all started out, they had to be the N95 mask. Everybody's wearing these little cloth masks. I said, nobody studied. You don't hear them studying these masks. But what it's going to do to the, the kids, they know about us. I know when I wear that mask, I don't feel right. That's why I don't like people coming to the meeting or I have to wear a mask and all this stuff. I don't wear the mask most of the time. And all this, and then I said, I guess, if I have to go into a store, and they tell you, I said, if it's a, we require a mask, that's up to their own business, I'll put the mask on and go in there. But I said, I'm not going to be, I don't like being told I have to wear it. And like I said, they got all these little kids wearing these masks. I'm going to tell you what, probably five, ten years down the road, they're going to find what kind of harm that mask has done to these kids. Because they're trying to keep studying this COVID thing, they're not saying what that will do to them. And I know that this all took effect. You know, you know, the woman of Lula, you know, she worked at the hospital. And that's what they said. They had a, there's a name for what that would do to you. You're stuck it in your own, pretty much your own cabin from breathing in and out. And it's not good for you. And I said that, what's it doing to these little kids when you put a mask on them? You see a little kid running around, you know, three, four years old, five, six, seven, going to school, wearing that thing six, eight hours a day. I mean, it might not be a fact I'm not, but it is going to cause a lot of asthma or something down the road. There's going to be a lot of breathing results because of this mask, I right? believe. They're not studying to tell you what that mask is like to it. They just tell you to wear it. And I said, you know, I think, you know, but I really think we need some different blood in the politics right now. Besides that Fauci, is that let somebody else who's running that might give us a little better idea, so you might trust some of this stuff you know, I would like to say you don't see them studying what kind of side effects that mask is going to do to anybody five, ten years from now. 
I'm not in favor of doing it in the fire thing. Like she said, I mean, like I said, that last vote, if it just said all masks, there's been a lot of people that didn't want to wear masks, it would come too. So it's going to work both sides. That's up to the people who we have to get We're going to do it in our, own, in our own little meeting, you know, if that's what you want to hold there. But I mean, honestly, I, mean, I can't, like I said, I can't emphasize enough what happened to the six, six and a half feet. You know, that was supposed to be, well, they stay six and a half feet away from each other. You were safe. I mean, why not? But what's wrong with that? I mean, you didn't have anything way. near the space to, to keep people six feet away from each other when we had the town meeting uh, two uh, weeks ago. So but, but I, I noticed think, I think that, that the, 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 the masked people sat with the unmasked people. Yeah. There was no fear there. Yeah. Our, our table was full of, of masked people. Yeah. And, and, and people there was plenty of room, I do. But, but there was plenty of room for those people to sit with un, with with the masked people, but they chose to sit with the unmasked, which, sure. again, it's fine. But I, I just wonder if it's just people following a rule because it's a rule, not because of fear. And the people who don't follow it is because they have no fear. Right. I think those that want to wear masks wear masks. I point. think that's what it should be too. I think it should be the people's choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like you said, everybody mixed and mingled anyway. The guy that just had the mask on felt safe, I guess, you know? Mm -hmm. and the ones that didn't wear it, they felt safe. So, I mean, let's leave it up to the people. Let's leave it up to them to just make a decision. And I think we're going to get a lot further ahead because, like I said, all I, all I can see is we're going to come down to the point where it's going to be two sided. I don't like this guy because he ain't wearing a mask, you know, or this one or whatever. It's almost it's almost like discrimination, I guess. All right, Katie, you wanted to say something? I thought you had your hand. Oh, yeah. I, um, I do feel like there are certainly people who are still wearing masks and going out to meals and sitting in restaurants. And then there's a whole invisible part of the community who are really closed in because they can't risk it. And that sucks for them. And that sucks really bad. So I don't, it's a very careful edge that we have to walk on. Are we prepared to maybe have a BCA meeting again and vote someone other than Carolyn? Are we, like, these are all the things that we are going to have to do if we don't place a temporary thing in. and. 45 days from now is the first week of February. Well, Carol, when it would come up to um, when it would come up to review again, and and that and bringing that up, this is her place of work where and she feels unsafe, and we have to think about her feelings too. I mean, this is her place of work, and. Right. And we're only talking about the town office building and any special meetings that we may have. We may have more, we may not. So we at least know in the next 45 days we have no plans for a town meeting. Right, right now we don't even know if that's gonna happen. We don't know until mid January. So. Okay. so why don't we just say the town the town office? Like I said, I don't have a problem with Carol feels that she wants people to wear a mask when they come in to see her. I do not have that problem, you know? That's her right, she's working there. And so like I this what I was saying, so like the town office, if it's mandated in that, so that means everybody working that office has to wear a mask all the time they're in there working. Right, but she's also unless working they're at the town meeting. Unless they're in their private cubicles alone. I thought that right. was because they're not near anybody if they're sitting at their right. desk alone. Right, but six feet rule. Right. But Juanetta and Carol and Melissa, they're all working at these meetings. It's not, I mean, they're working. They're on the clock, even though it's whatever. They're getting paid for their attendance at these meetings. So we need, I mean, that's still working for them. Is that something you're willing to be like, no, sorry, that part doesn't matter? And we're trying to think about everybody in our community and everybody's health and everybody's feelings and everybody's rights and trying to do the best we can for everybody because you all count and well i'd like to know and we haven't heard anything about people not being able to attend normally if there's 
I can read this letter. Yeah. If it's not attend. Yeah. Right. We, we it's from Lynn Forrest, dear select. Oh, that's not the letter that she wrote. This is asking us to. Um, there was one from the mask mandate. I have this one from Gloria. But generally, if there's a, a big hurrah about it, we'll get a, a good response. If we've got one or two people, that's that's only one or two people. I thought the situation. Can I, can I ask a question? Are you? Did I understand that Carol? And I could be wrong. Carol does not want people coming into the office without wearing a mask. Correct. Wow. Okay. Okay. There's been instances where people have been in the town office. Carol has not had a mask on. The person has not had a mask on. There has never been an issue. So today is an issue. To, I mean, this whole thing is an issue. They are. I'm, all I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I just I I'm finding. I've seen. I've, I've observed her asking. On this one. I've observed her asking people if they want to wear a mask when they come through her door. And if not? I haven't seen somebody say no. <laughs> we have signs up on the doors. If, if Carol's behind the shield on her side of the counter, she may not wear the mask, but if she's, if she's doing a notary, she, she chooses the safety behind the mask. And she is understandable. And my thing is, it's her right to ask people to put a mask on when they come in. Yeah. But to make it a rule, a mandate to say, you know, you have to because there's going to might be a day that Carol's not there. She's out to lunch or whatever. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm just. I mean, she has flexibility. I, just, I, I know that there have been people in town office and I know there has been a conversation with Carol face to face. No mask on either person. So I'm just kind of concerned that we're picking and choosing on people who want to decide whether or not they want a mask mandate or whether or not they want, I, I don't know. I, I just think that if you feel uncomfortable and you want to wear a mask, that's your choice. You can put the mask on. If you don't feel comfortable wearing a mask and the person who comes in wants to wear a mask, that's your choice. So one thing we can do is before doing a vote, to vote this in, we could ask every employee in this office what they would like to see happen and then take a vote at our meeting on Monday night. I think I'd be more willing to do that. I mean, is this, this going to include the town garage or being a town building? No, it's just for the town offices and select board meetings. So why wouldn't why wouldn't it be a mandate for the entire town? It's just why are we just doing certain areas? Because yeah, I think we, we have more authority over. Sorry. Have another discussion on this. We could without going on all night tonight about it. I mean, no. oh, like sorry. I said, I think I think it's um, I think it should be the people's choice. You know what I mean? Do I don't feel, I don't like it when the government tells me I have to do so. I think that's what we're trying to spell out to a lot of these people now. You have to do it. I feel like one of the few places where we have authority is here in our own building. <laughs> and at our town meetings where we try to please all of the population of the town. Yeah, all of them. All of so them. we have to look at both, at both sides of it. Right. but we're on two sides so we have to somehow come into the middle i don't okay we meet in march so we can't just be outside and what if we together. table this motion until monday evening at our budget meeting after shall we say who would like to take a tally and a vote on everyone that works here to find out how they feel and then revisit it on monday with everybody in the building and Jay's building, I guess, if that's what you want to do, about how no, they feel about wearing masks. Covered, but... All right, let's do that then. So do we need I'll to make, make a motion? motion? That's what we do. We don't need to motion to table? No. Yeah, because I think, I think we really need to uh, have a better idea. I mean, we did it out of scare tactic when the COVID started. You know, wear your mask, whatever. 
Um, people have been vaccinated. I mean, we're down down the, the road here a couple of years. So, to, shall we table it and have the, have one out of reach out to everyone and bring it to us on Monday night? Yeah. For the first order yeah. of business. Yeah. Sure. And you know, and, and I tell you, you know, I'd really love to see a study with these people who studied these masks to see what kind of harm it is doing and if it's really doing that much good, you know? I mean, you know, well, like I said, like, they always said it's just that one mask, but I would really like, I mean, I remember one night at one of our meetings sitting there, you know, Christopher Williams, he didn't near pass that way as wearing that mask. Well, you can that find that research and present it to us, Mike, okay? Well, I, I will say, I yeah, stopped I, know. I mean, I'd really like to see it because, I mean, I mean, I don't have no three or four year old kid or something like wearing one now, but I'm telling you what, you're going to see a lot of those things coming down the line in eight, ten years, five years, maybe not even that long. But they're just doing to these kids that we're making wear on them every day at kindergarten, grade school, and all this, you know. Okay, so so just reiterating, we'll table this motion till Monday night, till we yeah. have more feedback from the people that work here yeah. from open to close, and then make a decision Monday. Is that? Is everyone okay with that? Yes. Great. Good night. Katie? Yes. Shelly? I guess so. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, we're going to move into pay orders. I would like to thank everyone for coming tonight and staying healthy, stay safe, and Merry Christmas!